So hello and welcome to our summer Bible study here at Palmasia Presbyterian Church on 1st and 2nd Samuel. This is July 18th. So we're making our way through 2nd Samuel now and we are actually getting uh, into the latter part of the class. Today we're going to be looking at 2nd Samuel 7, but before we do that, I want us to open with prayer and I wonder if we um, pull this up. And for y'all at home, just remember that I'm going to mute you all. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so Kim Tool, I wonder if you would read our prayer, and I will share it on the screen now. My heart, whoops, my heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. <clears throat> The Lord raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Kim. So I'm going to hand out these for those who don't have it. So today we're looking at um, second... Second Samuel in the seventh chapter. And so the past three or the past two weeks, we've looked at chapter five, chapter six, and now we move into chapter seven. I think in many ways, these are some of the most pivotal chapters of the entire book um, for a number of reasons, some of which we'll get in today. But if you think about it, in chapter five, David becomes king not only of Judah, but of Israel. So he is king of northern and southern Israel. So he kind of unifies uh, Israel as a whole. That's really important for a number of reasons, because remember when I gave that introduction video, and we talked about this at the beginning, Israel is a loose affiliation of tribes coming off this kind of rule by what were called judges. And so there was never a kind of unified Israel in the sense of we would think about it around um, the times of the kings. Now, when Saul took power, Saul was the first king, but Saul in no way kind of had Israel as a whole under his rule or reign. And so what happens with David in chapter five is he consolidates the entirety of Israel as a kind of unified nation state. That's really big. <clears throat> chapter six is David bringing the ark into Jerusalem. And that's important for a number of reasons. One is the ark has traveled with the Israelites for a long time. But it, for 20 years until, until chapter 6, it has just kind of sat in this, this place for a while, and no one had kind of attended to it um, in any larger way. With David bringing it into Jerusalem, it's doing two things. Well, it's doing three things. One is, first off, legitimizing the kingship of David. The second thing it's doing is it's legitimizing and centralizing Israel religious, cultural, and political life to Jerusalem. Um, and, uh, and the third thing kind of, well, I guess I'm kind of conflating the second and third, but it's, it's pulling uh, Jerusalem into a place that it hadn't been before. Jerusalem was, uh, the Canaanites were still in there. That was the one place, and Joshua, if you don't remember, they weren't able to get the Canaanites out. And so going in there, it turns it into uh, an Israelite stronghold. But it's also now, because the ark is there, the center of Jewish life. So all that has happened in two chapters. And so as we go into chapter 3 today, or excuse me, chapter 7, which is the third of these chapters, there is a, um, a covenant God makes with David. And it's a new covenant, and it's unique uh, in a lot of ways. And so I'm going to pull up our reading So we're in, we're in chapter 7. Um, hold on one second. Um, okay, 
Sorry about this. I had the wrong thing pulled up. Okay, so I'm going to pull this up now. So um, this is 2 Samuel 7, obviously, and there's, there's basically two parts. And so, um, Rob Weiringa, I, I wonder if you would read 1 through 17. And then Ed, I wonder if you would read uh, the remainder, which would start at verse 18. It's in the, you would have to read from your Bible. Is that okay, or do you want me to have sure, it? Just and I'll have it up on the screen. 2 Samuel 18. 7. Seven. Seven. So, yep. So, I want y'all, before we get into this, there we go. I want y'all to think of a couple of things um, as, we're, as we're looking at this chapter. The, the first is, pay attention to what's going on here with the dialogue between David, Nathan, and then Yahweh per Nathan, right? Nathan speaks on behalf of, of Yahweh of God. And then there's a response that David gives. And listen to what David's doing. I say this all the time. I'm getting to the point where I say it every week. But our familiarity with scripture and the way we just kind of read it as casual observers can lead us to miss out on a lot of details. And this chapter, I would argue, is the most theologically rich chapter in the entirety of First and Second Samuel. Now, theology never happens in a vacuum in scripture. But as far as what's going on theologically, this chapter is just, there, there's an abundance going on. So, Rob, when you're ready, if you'll read the, um, the first 17 verses. Okay, Rob, you are muted still. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Gotcha. Okay, I'm reading from the Jewish Study Bible, Well. Okay. When the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had granted him safety from all the enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, Here I am dwelling in a house of cedar, while the ark of the Lord abides in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and say to my servant David, Thus said the Lord, are you the one to build a house for me to dwell in? From the day that I brought the people of Israel out of Egypt to this day, I have not dwelt in a house, but have moved about in a tent and tabernacle. As I moved about wherever the Israelites went, did I ever reproach any of the tribal leaders whom I appointed to care for my people Israel? Why have you not built a house, have built me a house? of cedar. Further, say thus to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the flock, to be ruler of my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut down all your enemies before you. Moreover, I will give you great renown, like that of the greatest men on earth. I will, re I will establish a home for my people Israel, and will plant them firm so that they shall dwell secure and shall tremble no <coughs> more. Evil men shall not oppress them anymore as in the past. Ever since I appointed chieftains over my people Israel, I will give you safety from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that he, the Lord, will establish a house for you. When your days are done and you lie with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you one of your own house, and I will establish his kingship. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his royal throne forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he does wrong, I will chastise him with the rod of men and the affliction of mortals. But I will never withdraw my favor from him as I withdrew it from Saul, whom I removed to make room for you. Your house and your kingship shall ever be secure before you, and your throne shall be established forevermore. Nathan spoke to David in accordance with all these words and all this prophecy. Well, this is from the uh, Revised Standard Version. 
David's prayer, chapter, rather, verse 18. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me thus far? And yet this is a small thing in thine eyes, O Lord God. Thou hast spoken also in thy servant's house for a great while to come, and hast shown me future generations, O Lord God. And what more can David say to thee? For thou knowest thy servant, O Lord God, because of, of thy promise and according to thine own heart, thou hast brought me all this greatness to make thy servant know it. Therefore, thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, and there is no God besides thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what other nation on earth is like thy people, Israel, whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and terrible things by driving out before his people a nation and its gods? And thou didst establish for thyself thy people, Israel, to be thy people forever. And thou, O Lord, didst become their God. And now, O Lord, confirm forever the word which thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house. And do thou as, as, as thou hast spoken, and thy name will be magnified forever, saying, the Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and the house of thy servant David will be established before thee. For thou, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, hast made this revelation to thy servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, thy servant has found courage to pray this prayer to thee. And now, O Lord God, thou art God, and thy words are true. And thou hast promised this good thing to thy servant. Now, therefore, may it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O God, hast spoken, and with thy blessing shall the house of thy servant be blessed forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, friends, I want to walk through this because I made a pretty big claim. I said um, this is one of the most theological chapters in the entirety of First and Second Samuel. It, it's, it's also a chapter that numerous scholars have pointed to as the most pivotal chapter theologically for the entirety of the Old Testament. So extending beyond just First and Second Samuel. And we'll talk about why that's so in a second. Um, but be before we do that, I want to first just lift up a couple of points that's going on. So first off, we have Nathan, who just shows up on the scene out of nowhere, right? Nathan has not been in the book at all, and he just appears. He's a prophet, which uh, we get here. And a lot of times, um, kings had prophets around them. They were kind of to keep them responsible and to speak on God's behalf. And so... David has this idea and says, you know what? I'm living in a house of cedar. Uh, why, why doesn't God have a house? So one thing to point out before we get into this is um, the Hebrew word for house, as it's used in this chapter, is uh, bayit. And bayit can mean two things. Well, it can mean three. It can mean house, like a house you would live in. It can mean temple like a, a religious structure, and it also can mean dynasty, like a succession of family, generations. So David says, I want to build um, a house for the Lord. And Nathan says, right, verse 3, Nathan says, hey, that's a great idea, go ahead and do it. Right, so that's Nathan speaking. Well, all of a sudden, the word of the Lord comes to Nathan, and it's completely counter to what Nathan just said. And so now he's told that he needs to go to David and say this long, drawn-out thing. But basically, he's saying, I don't need a house. I'm free. I've been, I've been doing this since we were coming out. Of, I was coming out of Egypt with y'all. 
And so I don't need a house. There's this, there's this sense of, um, and this is a theological deliberation that happens when Samuel eventually builds the temple, is, is God in a fixed place, i.e. the ark or the temple, or is God extend beyond those places? And so in Christian theology, we talk about eminence, and that means God's presence amongst us, but we also speak about transcendence. That is, God's presence extends and exceeds beyond us. And so what's going on in this part is God is kind of speaking more about God's transcendence. I can't be constrained to a singular place, and I don't need a place. One other thing to point out, because I think this is really important, is God says through Nathan, uh, starting in verse 7, Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Remember, we talked about this in chapter 5 when David eventually built his house of cedar. That cedar in Jeremiah and Isaiah and other prophets is a sign of opulence and wealth in a kind of negative, in a negative sense. And so you, you, you get a kind of underhanded sense here that God's kind of making a dig at David with a house of cedar. He's like, hey, you might need that, but not me. That's not my style. Um, so then there's this part that starts in verse 8. Uh, it goes to 9, and it basically says, um, I took you from the pasture. You were just a shepherd. Now you're prince. I've been wherever you have gone. I have been with you when you defeated enemies, and I will make a great name for you. That is Yahweh saying in each and every instance, this was God doing this, not David, right? So David might have done those things, but God was acting through him. So the credit that David might claim for his greatness as a human is kind of taken away, and God's reminding him that, hey, I did all these things through you. You might have done those, but that was me that helped you do that. That's a reminder for, um, that, that's kind of a theological reminder that David is not just a king in a secular sense. David's kingship is um, a, an act of grace through God, and all of his military wins, etc., have come through God. So that was kind of a reminder, and now there's this covenant that starts to come, come forward. So he, it starts in verse 10, but the part I really want to start is with verse 12. So this is a covenant. God is making a covenant with David. There's covenantal language in here. And if you remember, there's a covenant with Abraham. There's a covenant with Jacob. There's covenants throughout scripture. Um, and these covenants with God are pivotal points. It's God indicating that he wants to be in an intentional relationship with certain people, right? And we, we talk about that in the sense of Israel, but it happens to certain leaders in Israel. Abraham's the very beginning of that. Now, what we have here is, an, uh, is a covenant that's happening with David. And I'm going to read this, um, but it's really important um, because there's a couple of things going on. But I would say 12 to 17 is the kind of meat of this passage. So it starts in verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings. But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Okay, so what's going on here? One is there's this kind of um, covenant being made with David. But when we get to chapter 12, you see it's starting to extend beyond David. It's talking about his son. So it says, when your son comes around, I will build a house for him. Again, this word uh, by Yif is being used in a number of ways. House, temple, dynasty. So essentially it's saying, he shall build a house for my name, a temple, 
and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So this is this is where the beginning of what has been called the messianic idea. This idea that there is an anointed one from God, and that will continue throughout history. Throughout perpetuity, there will be an anointed one. And that idea kind of built and built until there's the idea um, preceding the time of Jesus of someone that would be anointed um, as a savior of Israel in a way beside just kind of a king or ruler. This is um, a lot of scholars and academics and theologians point to this chapter as where that kind of idea arises from. So there's there's this really neat part, verse 14, where it says, um, if he commits iniquity, I will punish him. And then verse 15, which is but, but could be translated as nevertheless as well. This is the most pivotal line in the entirety of this. But I will not take my steadfast love from him. This is not a um, this is not a covenant with caveats or qualifications. This is unconditional. So <clears throat> remember, Saul had a covenant with God. He was made king, and yet God took that away from him because of Saul's disobedience in two cases: when he did not kill the Amalekites. And when he made a sacrifice before Samuel showed up to the battle with the Philistines. So this is saying, unlike Saul, if your offspring, your sons, your son's sons, if they commit an iniquity against me, I might punish them, but I will not pull back my contract from them. I will not, you know, kind of renounce my covenant that I have made. I can't emphasize enough how important that is and how unique that is. So I want to show you another example of a covenant with God, and I'm going to share my screen, but share something else. So if you look at this top text, this is from Exodus 19, 4 through 6. Julie Baker, I wonder if you could unmute yourself and just read these, uh, these, these few verses right here. Sure. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. Thanks. So this is God speaking to the Israelites, I believe, through Moses. And the point being here is you will be my people. I'm making a covenant relationship. But if you look, there is the contingency if you obey my voice. Right? What we just read in Samuel says, even if you are disobedient, I might punish you, but the, that doesn't um, invalidate the covenant. So this, this is, I, I know it feels like I'm parsing words here, but this is extremely important because... This is so unique to the covenants that have been made so far in Scripture. And this is um, what many people see as an unconditional love and a point towards grace, right? Grace is undeserved. You can't earn grace. You can't win grace. Grace is given by someone, God, who's much greater and much more loving than us. And so a lot of scholars, a lot of preachers and pastors and theologians have pointed to this as a kind of beginning glimpses of what we understand fully through Christ and as the beginning of a covenant that is uh, unconditional, is full of love, and is full of grace. So um, that, that, that covenant from um, Exodus is a great example of a conditional covenant because of that if language, and then obviously the one that God made was Saul because it's revoked. So after that, God... Um, after Nathan speaks for God, and King David goes and he set, sits before the Lord. So we can imagine he's sitting before the ark. He's in prayer, and there's this beautiful kind of prayer. Remember, David is very articulate. We have um, plenty of language in First and Second Samuel uh, that indicate that, as well as songs that are attributed to him. And there's this very kind of um, beautiful and thoughtful uh, prayer that results. Um, Walter Brueggemann says that this begins with deference, it moves to praise, and it ends with a demand. Now, I know a lot of us um, 
have this like overly uh, pious sense that when you're talking to God, it's it's, it's got to be, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you can't just start demanding stuff of God, right? That seems kind of untoward or impious. But we have to remember in the Psalms and what we see here is that making a demand of God happens a lot. And that's what David does. So this begins with him using the word, O oh Lord God, or um, uh, uh, there's O oh Lord and O oh Lord God um, five times. So you can see like Lord here, O oh Lord God here, O oh Lord God, O oh Lord God, O oh Lord God, and then O oh Lord. Um, so he's, he's speaking to God. He's using God a lot. This is very kind of high. Uh, there's a, there's a sense of piety, a sense of deference here. One thing else to point out is this is probably one of the clearest monotheistic verses in Samuel that we'll see. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is no one like you. So we see other instances in scripture where it won't say this language. It'll say, um, you are stronger than the other gods, Lord, or O oh, Yahweh, you are better than the other gods, or you are... You are more loving than the other gods. This is language that's saying there aren't other gods. It is just you, right? Because in certain parts of scripture, there's a sense that Yahweh exists among other gods. And so David is using this very monotheistic language there. So he talks about um, God's relationship with Israel. And then in verse 24, we see that this covenant that has been given to David extends beyond David, right? David represents Israel as their king. And this says, and you established your people Israel for yourself to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. So this, this covenant that God's made with David is given in that sense. It's very private in a way, but it speaks on behalf of the people of Israel as a whole. And so... Um, now we get this language in now. And when you see this in scripture, the Hebrew word for this is indicating a demand is about to be made. So David's gotten through the piety and the holy speak, and now he's like, all right, now this is what I want. These are my demands. And so he basically is kind of saying, hey, you made this covenant. You better do it. And one of the words he uses here four times um, is forever. So it's used as an adverb, confirm it forever. And um, you'll see that four times over and over. So essentially, David's just making the demand that you, you live this covenant out. You can imagine in David's mind, he saw what happened to Saul. Um, David's probably uh, self-aware enough to know that he's not perfect, and he could never live up to what God would want of anyone. And so he's just making sure that this kind of unconditional covenant is carried out. And then we see here, there's some other language for him speaking to God. And it's as much, um, I, I would guess you'd say like more ornate language. The Lord of hosts is God. And then over here, O Lord of hosts. So the language um, continues, but there's the demand being made, right? I talked about and now. So you're seeing that again. Um, and then this language of it continuing forever. Um, in verse 39, now therefore may it please you to bless the house of your servant, the dynasty of your servant, so that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed forever. So it has some demands, but it ends with this acknowledgement and recognition that all things happen through God. So I'm going to stop it there. There, there's, there's a lot going on in this chapter, but I think the thing we want to focus on is um, God is making two things. He's saying, I don't want a house right now. And as we remember, he'll make a house with uh, Solomon later. And then he's saying, um, David, here is this covenant I've made with you. One interesting thing to point out is um, this text, as we talked about, was written years and years and years after David, right? David is somewhere around a thousand, and this was most likely written during the exile in Babylon. And um, one thing they're trying to kind of make sense of is why was David, who is kind of lifted up as the most important king of all kings, 
in the Israelites' history. Why didn't he build God a temple? And so here we have kind of an explanation of that. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, David says God spoke to him, and God said, David, you've killed way too many people. Your hands are full of blood and the death of others, and therefore you are not the one that will build my house. So you see in Chronicles another kind of wrestling with why didn't David build that. The last thing I want to end on, because this is important, right? We are coming to this as Christians, as people that have knowledge of the New Testament. And it's important to remember how central this messianic promise, this covenant, is to understanding who Christ is. Because um, when the Babylons came and destroyed Judah, that was the end of the, the kingship of Israel for, for all intents and purposes. And so that covenant, people were saying, what happened to the covenant of God? He said, the house of David will continue forever. And so it's at that point that Israel starts thinking of that covenant in different terms beyond just a Messiah, an anointed one who is a king. Now they start thinking about prophets, about Messiahs that are spiritual leaders. Um, some still had hope for someone that would have been like David, um, that would have been a military leader. So if you think about Maccabees, which isn't in our Bible, but is a, a, a biblical book, um, it's in what's called the Apocrypha. Maccabees is about an uprising against the Romans. And a lot of people thought the Maccabees were fulfilling that kind of continuance of the house of David, right? But we as Christians believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and the Messiah in a way we could never imagine the Messiah, right? Because it is the actual, literal Son of God. And so in Matthew uh, and in Luke, and there's plenty of examples elsewhere, but I just want to read these real quick so we can kind of draw this to the present and think about how important this passage is in the person of David to Christ. So in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, starting it off, it says, An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, right? It's making connection back. Matthew 1.20, just a little bit later. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And then in Luke, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And then just a few verses later, 32 through 33, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Okay, so that's probably the most clear of all of these. It's not just saying the house of David or the the, the son of David, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. So you're seeing this kind of this covenantal promise that happened thousands of years before or a thousand years before Christ roughly being transferred to the person of Christ. And obviously it's being enriched in many ways beyond just this kind of royal uh, covenant. So that's really important to consider and think through, especially when we move into the time of Advent, because this language is so rich in Advent. And I think having this context gives us a greater appreciation of Advent and that kind of anticipation that was happening then. So I want to stop now and open it up to y'all. What thoughts, questions, reflections do y'all have on this passage? Well, yes, Rob. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Very good. Yeah, uh, just a, a sentence out of the uh, rabbi's commentary in the Jewish study Bible. Uh, they really agree with you that verse 24 is, is central to this. And this is what they write. The idea that Israel is the Lord's people and that he is Israel's God is central in biblical thought and Judaism in general. So I, I did, that's a, such a clear uh, affirmation of what you said about verse 24. And uh, it just strikes me that 
we're living with this dynamic, uh, you know, for the last 3,000 years in terms of dealing with Jews who have rejected Jesus as the Messiah and who still have a, a heritage, religion, and civilization that is aggressively um, pursuing uh, its place in its geography. And I think sometimes for us as Christians, this verse, um, it, it gives us pause in terms of, you know, if I believe in Jesus as the Christ, what do I do with literally millions of Jews who refer to verse 24 and say, we are God's people. Uh, this is our capital city. This is our land. Uh, there is no West Bank. There is no Palestine. Because look at what God says in verse 24. <clears throat> it seems to me uh, there's, um, for me as a Christian, uh, this presents a little bit of a challenge for me uh, since I have uh, faith in Jesus Christ as my Messiah. Uh, <clears throat> but this still is a clash for us 3,000 years after it was written. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, so, so that's a lot, and I'll, I'll, I'll respond to it. But before I do, I want to point out, I think verse 16 and verse 24 are probably the most pivotal um, from, this, from this chapter. So if you're, if you're reading through this back at home or you're kind of studying this, verse 16 kind of, kind of concretizes the covenant, and verse 24 um, is remembering um, that this covenant made with David expands and considers all of Israel. <coughs> So I, I, I think it's important to, to address what you said, and I, I, I want to start with one thing, and that is the Bible is never theology in a vacuum. It's always happening in the context of a history, and that history has political and cultural um, context as well. And so when we get something like we're, we're reading in here, it's not just some simple um, theological statement that God just <coughs> kind of makes. This is told by a people that are in exile and trying to understand while they're in exile. They are looking back in their history and telling that history. Um, we can imagine that David utilizes his role as king. He, he, he in many ways, probably uh, manipulates uh, religion for his own ends. But he can do it in pious ways as well. I don't think we can say it's one or the other. The, that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is, I, I, I think you can't say um, Jews as a whole. That's, there, there is no monolithic Jew. There are definitely Jews that are Zionist, and that's their kind of political philosophy, and it's deeply tied into their faith and belief. But there are plenty of Jews that are not, as you use the language of aggressive, or trying to kind of completely have a, a single Israelite state. That's that's a political as well as a theological thing to wrestle with. So I wouldn't that I, I just would be very apprehensive about using Jews as a singular group, just as we would never talk about Christians as a singular group. The other thing I would say is um, yes, the that there are folks in, 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 in Israel that are utilizing this language and other theological beliefs to kind of mandate their rule uh, and their place in that land. But we have to remember the Crusades and the hordes of Christian polit politicians that have used this language before. There are <coughs> plenty of Christians today that are trying to create a theocracy in the United States. Um, we've seen that run rampant in the past few years. And so it, I, I just think it's a little one-sided to say, oh, um, the, the Jews have kind of used this, but, you know, we Christians are free of any sense of trying to have a theocracy. That's a really good question for us to consider as we're reading this passage, because it's important to think about what is this promise God is making to David, and what does it look like for that to continue forward into perpetuity? Are we people that think God should rule over all governments and those in, 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 in leadership are to be kind of ordained by God? Or are we to see um, God is standing in the lives of people and compelling us towards 
uh, ministry and witness and mission, but in a way that is not trying to manipulate the pit political sphere. That, I'm sure we all have plenty of thoughts on that, but a, a passage like that does bring this up because this is happening in a very political context. It is a theological covenant, but it's happening to a person who is king of a nation state. Um, so, uh, yeah, Rob, thanks for bringing all that up. I think that starts a lot of questions, especially just contextually for our day and age. Um, history is, is literally uh, drenched in the blood of people that have claimed various religions uh, and various gods as their reason for killing other people. Now, as someone who professes Christ, I would think that that is anathema. Um, but, yeah. Thank you, Will. We need Thank to you. on Christ and culture. Hey, that's, uh, that's coming up after Easter next year. <laughs> that was a little plug. Rob's plugging his class. What other thoughts or questions do you guys have, uh, Ed? Yes. Well, you know, I think your comment about framing this event in that particular culture and what it meant to them at that time uh, as well as how it may look from a remote period of time. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that the people had no idea that the world was as large as it is. Mm -hmm. And there were always tribes, <coughs> cultures, people coming up out of nowhere and threatening the very survival and existence of individual societies. The Romans, for example, would be attacked by um, uh, tribes, barbarians that spoke languages that they'd never heard before. They didn't know they existed. They didn't know these people existed. Right. And they could bring, they could focus strong military power that would overcome any little city, anything any little city state could put together or right. anything like that. So, an advantage of having a uh, a king of Israel is in part military in that he can bring enough power to protect individual little parts of it. Yeah, yeah. And th then the with the comment about the Jews and so forth, did Christ ever say he wasn't Jewish? Right, and, and I mean, Paul talks about Jewish <laughs> people as the root of Christianity. And did he ever say to form a new religion? Right. I don't think he ever did. No. As far as I'm concerned, I'm the same relief that David was, Christ was, and that I am now. Yeah. And I don't I don't see any exclusion there or, or a conflict. That's a great point. And Romans address, uh, addresses that directly um, throughout 9, 10, 11, throughout those chapters. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was a big question then. Thanks. Well, in that section, uh, you're talking about, you know, it starts on 2 Samuel, verse 12. Yeah. When your days are fulfilled, you lie down with your fathers. I will raise your offspring up after you, et cetera. And he talks about building, your son will build a building. Uh, it sounds like Christ is in there as he starts. Is This is David. Is this... The thing that confused me about this particular passage was you had to know who was doing the talking. Right. You start with Nathan talking as a regular, not as a prophet, as a man. And then the next thing you know, Nathan gets the word from God, oh, by the way, go back and tell Nathan. Right. So we're going on. And so now, in these sections, at what point does, when David sits before God, he's communing directly with God. Is that correct? There's no Nathan in the room. Is that what we're You're saying when David is speaking? Well, I think the thing to, to understand is you've got to know who's he talking to, who's talking back to him, and you get the two with Nathan, and then David goes into, uh, I can't... It just says he goes before the Lord. Yeah, the prayer of gratitude, that's 18. So what's happening up in, is it Nathan above that... In verse 12, when your days are fulfilled, is Nathan just talking in the words of God to David? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, they, Nathan is speaking on God's behalf. All right, I'm wondering because when they start to talk about look at look at verse 17. <coughs> Why don't you read verse 17? You see 17. <coughs> in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Yeah. So that tells us anything before that. Nathan's delivering the person. Yes. All right. Then this gets into I will be the father and he shall be to me a son. Now is is Nathan. Or is God referring to Christ there? That, you know, I looked at that. And, no, he's speaking about David. All right, he's just speaking about David's lineage then. Yes. Okay, so. So it, one thing to think through is when we talk about the Old Testament referencing Christ, it, there, there's various ways to think about that. The way I think about it, and this isn't right or wrong, it's my interpretation of it, is it's, it's pointing in ways that it could never fully understand Christ. So I wouldn't say it's talking about Christ because Christ hasn't happened yet. So they can't fully speak about Christ. Um, it's pointing toward the lineage of David in this way that they'll never fully understand because they don't know the history that's to come. But as we have Christ, we look backward and say, oh, this makes so much more sense in the context of Christ. There's a, um, I think he's seventh century uh uh, uh, Orthodox theologian uh, named Maximus the Confessor. Now that I'm saying that, I think he was fifth century. All the same, he's early, right? And he said <laughs> the Old Testament isn't pointing forward to Christ. Christ rewrites the Old Testament. So essentially, the person of Christ affects the Old Testament in a way where you can never read it the same again. And I think that's a really helpful way to think about it. So while we, while I would say this isn't referring explicitly to Christ, as Christians we look back on this and say, you know, I mean Luke does this right. Yeah. Christ is to fulfill the throne of David. But remember, what is the throne of David? Is it militaristic? Is it a warrior? Is it a king? Christ was a a, a carpenter, a peasant. He was born out of wedlock, and he died as a Roman criminal. That's nothing like David, right? So this throne of David is greatly overturned and expanded through the person of Christ. Did, did someone at home have a question? I thought I saw a hand. Craig, and then Pam. Yeah, I noticed um, that uh, verse 24, it says, you yes. have established your people, Israel, as your very own. Mm -hmm. Now, is the people Israel only the people that live in what was then considered the land of Israel? Or are we also part of the people Israel uh, with a new covenant uh, from Jesus Christ? Well, I think it would be really worthwhile for everyone to read at least Romans 9 today uh, to get a good idea of what Paul thinks about all of this. <laughs> But in the context of this, this is speaking explicitly about the people of Israel. So that, that kind of what was a loose tribal group of folks that has now become a nation state under David. Now, like I said before, as we read back into this, you know, we think we are part of that lineage of Christ. But in this context, verse 24 is referring explicitly to Israel. Historically, yes. Yeah. Pam? Um, I like I like what Craig said because I keep thinking there has to be a way to pull people together and this monotheistic approach, whether whoever it is you believe in kind of might do that. So that was an interesting concept, Craig. Thank you. Um, the other thing is I was interested in what you said about the uh, Maccabees uprising. Now, um, mm -hmm. can you tell more about that? Because I didn't get it in my notes. Oh, yeah. I could not speak in detail about Maccabees because I have not read it in forever. And I've, I've never done an in-depth study of it. Um, but Maccabees essentially was a family that got tired of the Romans. So if you, if you think about this, the Assyrians uh, in the, the 8th century BC attacked Israel. Okay? And so they, Assyrians ruled Israel. And then um, in the 6th century, the Babylonians came in and attacked Judah, which was the southern kingdom. And from that point on, 
Um, after that, right, after that is Cyrus, who is a Persian, and that's when the, the, they, leave the, they leave Babylon and return. That's like um, uh, Ezekiel, right, and Hezekiah. No, not Hezekiah, Ezekiel um, and Nehemiah, sorry. Um, so, so if you think about this, Assyrians, Babylonians, and then Persians, and then ultimately the Romans. So the Jewish people have been under foreign rule for hundreds upon hundreds of years. And essentially, they just get tired of it. And there's uprisings that happen, but the Maccabees is one of the most um, well-known of the uprisings and one of the more successful uprisings. It was led by a family. Um, one of the, I think it was the father or one of the sons uh, was known as the Hammer. I mean, they're, they're literally kind of like guerrilla warriors. They're, they, they, they fought against Rome as this kind of guerrilla outfit. And so... There are these books in Scripture that we call Apocrypha. They're typically written between the Old and New Testament, um, and they are included in the Orthodox and the Catholic Bible, but not in the Hebrew Bible or our Old Testament or our New Testament. Um, but you can find them online easily. Most Bible sites will have them, and... Um, they go by 1st, 2nd, and I believe 3rd Maccabees. I'm trying to think. I have them in my Bible. I've got an outlaw Bible. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's, uh, I, I believe there's a 3rd Maccabees, but most Bibles only, like Protestant and Orthodox, only include 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Because those are considered to be more legitimate and authentic um, than the others. But there are more than two, I believe. Well, doesn't that come in the Septuagint? Yes, yeah. right, in the Orthodox Bible, yep. But which holiday um, celebrates them? Is it Passover or is it mm -hmm. uh, I do not know. It's, um, it's, it's Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Oh, oh, that's right, candles. yeah, there you go. Yeah. The candles will not burn out. Right. You know what would yep. be cool is for us to have a class on Maccabees. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I'm serious. That would be a great class. The Apocrypha has some really good books. Like um, there's Sirach, uh, the wisdom of, of, of Jesus. Uh, not Jesus is our, our, our Jesus, but another Jesus. Um, there's additions to Esther. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. But we're getting off track. Hey, Will, can I end with a, a takeaway that I see here? Sure. Um, the, sometimes the Old Testament can feel so far away and hard to find the applicable piece here, but the thread that I keep seeing through the Samuel study is how God, because of his love for his people, kept reaching out, kept explaining himself, and here he is with David telling him, I was with you through all these different things that have happened in your life. That's really all you need to know. There's no guarantee life is going to be easy from here on out. And as we know about David, it wasn't easy. Um, and David still bumbled and made mistakes. But there's just great assurance and hope and peace knowing that that is still true with us today. No matter what tomorrow brings, we're not doing this journey alone. And really, that was the promise that God gave David. I'm going to work in you. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to work through you. <laughs> so you better buckle up. Um, but there's just a lot of assurance in knowing that there's a plan and God's in charge. Yeah, that's a, a great message to end with. And I think that's the message of grace, right? Grace mm -hmm. is unearned, it's undeserved in many ways, and yet God uh, comes to us. And ultimately, that's the message of love, right? Love in its purest form is unconditional, uh, and it's relational. And I think that's one of the things you're lifting up, Julie, right? God isn't just a God that floats around somewhere outside of earth. God is a God that is deeply involved in humanity's story and in history and in our lives as individuals and as communities. So, yeah, that's a great, great point. Thank you, Julie. Um, it is close to ending time, so I'm going to pull up the benediction. I thank you all for joining us. This was a really good conversation. We didn't get to touch on everything. Read Romans 9. Uh, if you're really interested in something, go read Maccabees. Um, 
But I think you're seeing that these stories are alive and well today. They are important, and that's why we're reading and wrestling with them. And uh, it's it's just a great reminder that God is a living God and uh, with us and among us. Um, and the warning that God can be manipulated, right? Um, religion can be manipulated. So we got to be both uh, um, wise as, uh, what is it? Wise as serpents. And uh, what's the second part? <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's, that's terrible. Tough. Yeah, right. I just remember the serpent part. Oh, yeah. It's something about the it was the owl. Yeah, innocent and well, yeah. well, anyhow, you know, be loving and thoughtful, but careful. There's uh there's plenty of charlatans out there. All righty, let's uh let's close with our benediction. I appreciate y'all joining us, and this has been a, a really good time to uh, wrestle and learn from this text. So let's together read. And now, oh, sisters and brothers. Go from this place knowing that the God who made you also sustains you. The God who calls you also goes with you. May the Father be with you and speak through you. May Christ Jesus be one with you and raise you to life. And may the Holy Spirit dwell within you and make you holy. Amen. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.